بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك عليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is our uh, third class uh, inshallah covering the <coughs> basic concepts of the world major religions so the first week we spoke of our tradition of Islam as well as the second week. <clears throat> so today, inshallah, tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to begin um, the first part of the religion of Judaism. Um, so it's, it's difficult to distill a religion down to uh, a couple of sessions, but uh, I'll do my best, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, also at 8.20 or so, We'll take a break, maybe seven or eight minutes, uh, so uh, we can pray Maghrib, inshallah ta'ala, for those of us on West Coast time. So um, I thought a good um, uh, thing to look at when it comes to Judaism is the famous creed of uh, Maimonides. So Maimonides... Um, famous rabbi and philosopher. He died in the early 13th century. Uh, he was buried uh, in Fustat in Egypt. Uh, Moshe ben Maimon is his name. And um, Jews refer to him as the Rambam. That's the sort of acronym. It means Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. Um, he was an incredible scholar. He was uh, a great scholastic. He was a great synthesizer of, um, of uh, uh, Jewish thought as well as uh, Aristotelian ethics. Um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that as well. He believed that revelation and reason go hand in hand. He was a natural theologian, uh, meaning that he believed that one could engage in uh, reason and philosophy uh, as evidence of God. He was a champion of what's known as negative theology, and we'll explain that uh, as well, inshallah. He, he, he wrote quite extensively. Probably his two greatest uh, works are the, uh, and he wrote them in Arabic. Uh, at least the first one was in Arabic, Dalalatul Ha'irin, which is oftentimes uh, translated as the guide for the perplexed. Uh, it's uh, called the More uh, Nevuchim in Hebrew, three volumes. Um, and basically, the aim of the guide for the perplexed who are the perplexed? Who are these people in the state of Hira? These are people that cannot reconcile Naqal with Aqal. They can't reconcile the revelation with reason. So, again, that's sort of the job, as it were as we said last week, of the dialectic uh, theologian to reconcile the two. So that's what he attempts to do in the famous Guide for the Perplexed. His uh, second famous text is called the Mishnah Torah, which is a commentary on uh, the Torah, uh, Jewish uh, law and scripture. And in his Mishnah Torah, uh, Maimonides articulated basic creed, right? So his creed is 13 principles. That's all it is, 13 lines. Uh, and it's taken from the Tanakh and the Talmud. So we sort of have to get familiar again with our terminology. What are we talking about when we say Tanakh is another acronym uh, that uh, the Tau comes from Torah, there's a noon in there, which is from Nibin, means prophets. And then the calf, which is more guttural in Hebrew. Um, so Tanakh comes from Kitobim, the writings. So um, it's basically the Hebrew Bible, right? Tanakh and Hebrew Bible are synonymous. Of course, Christians would call this the Old Testament, right? So the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, the Tanakh, these are all synonymous. Of course, the term Old Testament is Christian terminology, 
uh, Jews, at least Orthodox Jews, would find the term Old Testament to be a bit um, offensive, um, which implies that the, the covenant that God made with Moses and the Israelites on Sinai has been uh, abrogated. Uh, so, so that's the Tanakh, right? So you have the Torah. So what do we mean by Torah? What do they mean by Torah? They mean the five books of Moses, right? Um, this is called, also called in Hebrew the Chumash because the term Torah is a bit ambiguous, right? Sometimes when Jews use the word Torah, they're talking about the five books of Moses. Sometimes they're talking about the entire Old Testament, the entire Tanakh. Sometimes they're talking about all of the sacred literature, including the Talmud, and we'll talk about that. So the term Torah is a bit ambiguous. But when we say Chumash, which comes from, which is related to the Arabic word Chamsa, right, Pentateuch in Greek, here we're talking about the first five books of the Tanakh, right? The books that are traditionally ascribed to, to Musa alayhi salam, and Orthodox Jews believe, in fact, that Musa alayhi salam wrote these five books on Mount Sinai um, some uh, 3,500 years ago. He wrote them over 40 nights. He was in sort of a trance. He did not sleep. He did not eat. He did not drink. He was simply receiving uh, these five books. And what are these five books called? Well, in Hebrew, the first book is called Bereshith, which comes from the very first word. And that's how they're all called in Hebrew. It's the first word uh, or so, uh, a word in the first verse of the first chapter of that book. In this case, Genesis right, is called Bereshith because the book begins, Bereshith bara Elohim et hashemayim v'het aharetz, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? Um, however, it's called Genesis in English, uh, which is taken from Greek. So the, t the titles of the books uh, that we know are taken from Latin and Greek, and of course, they're, they're taken into the English language. Uh, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These are the five books of Moses. The, this is the Chumash, right? This is uh, the first five books of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. The Orthodox believe, again, that Moses himself, Musa alayhi salam, wrote these books. Um, they are equivalent to uh, our conception of the Qur'an as far as the Qur'an being um, a dictate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa alayhi salam is not being inspired. These are not his words. He's not receiving some sort of inspiration or iha, and then he's articulating the wording himself. The lafth is not his. right? Just like with the Qur'an, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is receiving the words, either through exterior or interior locution. And he's simply repeating those words that he's hearing from outside of himself or that he's perceiving within himself. So that is the status of the Chumash, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. right? And then we have the Nabim, the prophets. Now, so there's another set of books in the Old Testament that um, are, are called after certain prophets. Right, so you have books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Amos, uh, Zephaniah, um, etc., Micah. Right, uh, so these books are believed by Jews to be inspired by God. Right, so it's not a ipsissima verba, you know, word for word dictate. It's more like hadith, if there's something comparable in our tradition inspired words of God, where a prophet would receive uh, inspiration, but that prophet would use his own words. He would articulate that inspiration. And then you have a third class of revelation, right? So, or degree of revelation in the Old Testament, which is called the Kitobim, the writings or hagiography. And these are books that are authored by non-prophets. For example, Proverbs. So Jews don't believe that David and Solomon are prophets. This is a difference of opinion that we have with them. So the Psalms, for example, uh, is Kitobim. Uh, so a lower degree of revelation. Still sacred writings, canonical and sacred, but not as high, right? Not, not as great 
as the writings of Isaiah, and Isaiah is not as great uh, as or exalted as the writings of Moses, uh, which are not even the words of Moses. They are the words of God spoken by, uh, by Moses. So Maimonides' Creed is taken from the Tanakh, a.k.a. Old Testament, as well as something called the Talmud. The word Talmud is related uh, to um, uh, the Arabic Tilmid, right? And Tilmid means like a, a pupil, right? So the Talmud is sort of the pupil or the little student of the Torah. The Orthodox believe the Talmud is also sacred writing, right? So it has a status that we would, uh, the equivalent in our tradition would be something like Ilham, right? Or Iha, which is non prophetic revelation. So not Wahi. Wahi, according to our scholars like Imam Suyuti and Zarkashi and others, uh, the, the term Wahi is, is prophetic revelation. So uh, Musa alayhi salam in our tradition, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, they received Wahi, right? But uh, saints or non-prophets, the Quran says that the Hawariyun, the disciples of Isa alayhi salam, received iha, non-prophetic revelation, inspiration, inspired revelation. Right? So the, the Talmud then has two parts. The Talmud is made up of the Mishnah and Gemara. Right? Mishnah and Gemara. Um, so the Mishnah, uh, according to Judaism, is the oral law of Moses that was finally reduced to writing. So here's something interesting that a lot of people don't know, even a lot of secular Jews don't know, is that uh, in the Orthodox tradition, Jews, Orthodox Jews believe that Moses received two Torahs on Mount Sinai. He received the first five books, which is the very words of God, but he also received inspiration um, that, uh, that he eventually would articulate piecemeal over his life in his own words. Um, so essentially a commentary of the written Torah, right? So he received the first five books, and then Musa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him according to Judaism, he, as, as he would live his life and situations would arise with the Israelites in the Sinai uh, uh, wilderness, uh, he would, he would comment, uh, commentate or interpret what was written in the first five books with his own words. And those words were eventually written down in the first century of the common era uh, so it's kind of like the hadith of Musa alayhi salam, his tafsir, if you will, of, of the Chumash. So it was written down um, and uh, called the Mishnah, right? And then between the second and seventh centuries of the common era, second and seventh century, second and eighth century, um, uh, rabbis began to um, write commentaries on the Mishnah, right? And that was called the Gemara. So Gemara means completion. So you have the Tanakh, right? The Old Testament, which is the Torah, the Chumash, in other words. The Nabim, the prophets, the Kitubim, the writings. And then you have the Talmud, which is made up of the Mishnah, the oral law that Moses received that was eventually reduced to writing in the first century because the temple had been destroyed and now the religion was in danger, so the rabbis decided to write it down. And then you have rabbinical commentaries written on the Mishnah that occurred uh, primarily in two locations, at the uh, rabbinical academy in Babylon or Iraq, and, uh, as well as the rabbinical academy in, uh, in Palestine. So you really have two versions then of the Talmud. You have the Babylonian Talmud and you have the um, Palestinian uh, Talmud. Okay. Okay. So, so Maimonides then, the genius of Maimonides is that he's able to take this massive corpus of literature. I mean, you look at the, the, um, the Tanakh and the Talmud, I mean, 
millions of words, and he's able to distill it and give us the bare bones of Jewish theology. And that's what he does here with his 13 articles of Jewish faith, 13 principles of Jewish faith. And he says very clearly that if you don't believe in any one of these, you are a kofir, right, a kafir, in his opinion. Now there's some difference of opinion uh, amongst Jewish theologians. Uh, Joseph Albo, for example, a 15th century Spain, uh, Spanish uh, rabbi, said that only three of the 13 are essential. In Maimonides, he confused uh, which is essential with that which is derivative. But generally, Maimonides' articulation of the creed is accepted by, by Jews the world over. Right? So uh, he called these the Sholosha Ashar Iqare Emuna, which literally means the 13 principles of Jewish faith. So at this point, um, we're going to take maybe a seven minute break inshallah, and we're going to pray the Maghrib, and then we'll come back and we'll begin with the first couple of principles as articulated by Maimonides, inshallah. <clears throat> so, now continuing to principle number one, iqar number one, as articulated by Maimonides. He says, <clears throat> He says, I believe with full faith, with perfect faith or sound faith, that the Creator, blessed be His name, and uh, the Hebrew here is, um, if you know Arabic, you could pick up Hebrew quite easily. He says, So, Anni Ana Mu'minun Bil Iman Salima. So, I believe with sound faith that the bore al-bari, that the creator, yithbarach shmo, tabaraka ismu, blessed be his name. He creates, he says, and he guides all of creation. Uh, and he by himself did and is doing and will do all actions. And it's very poetic here, the way that he, that he frames it, using the oseva, Asa the Ose the Yaasa. So he uses the the perfect tense verb. Then he uses the active participle, and then he uses the imperfect tense verb. So basically, what he's saying in this principle, the first principle of the thirteen, is that God alone is the Creator and direct doer of all things. That God is the primary cause. He's the efficient cause of all things, which is contra Aristotle, right? For Aristotle, God is not the efficient cause because Aristotle believed that the universe is uh, pre-eternal, right? Um, so uh, for Aristotle, God, the unmoved mover, is kind of like a giant cosmic magnet uh, that, uh, who draws all things unto himself, so there's sort of an unconscious pull towards God. Uh, and God did not create ex nihilo, according to Aristotle's uh, metaphysics. Uh, so um, God is only the final cause for Aristotle. But now, in, in Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, God is ultimately the final cause, but he's also the efficient cause, meaning that there was a sort of conscious push that he is the beginning, the ontological origin of all things. The universe is not pre-eternal in the past. The universe was created from nothing, ex nihilo. The, the universe was created from nothing by God, right? So God is the efficient cause, the primary cause. So he says that God by himself, right? He did and is doing and will do all actions. Right? So you can think about here, no one does God's actions except God. None, uh, no one can create anything except for God. Right? So if you examine the, the rationalist, the Mu'tazila claim, this controversial, controversial the creation of that the rationalists who are highly influenced by 
Greek philosophy. They, they said that due to our absolutely free will, we create our own actions. We are the creators of our own actions. That our actions, in effect, inform God himself. So that God only knows what we decide to do. So things are not uh, predetermined. So you have rationalist elements um, in the Jewish world as well. And it seems that Maimonides, a lot of these, or you can argue all of the 13 principles, has a polemical aspect uh, to them. In other words, he is trying to argue against a position that he believes to be heretical. This idea that God does not create everything, that we create some of our actions, that God does not know everything. He doesn't know particulars. He only knows, you know, um, essences. Um, so this is... Uh, soundly refuted by Maimonides in his writings, as well as the theologians of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they also had to deal with this idea. And our theologians, they would quote from the Quran, right? Wallahu khalaqukum wa ma ta'malun, that God created you and your actions, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only real creator, right? Allahu khaliku shay, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. Uh, so these are some of the proof texts that our theologians would use. Maimonides would quote from the book of Isaiah, for example, which is in the Nabim, the prophets, that middle section of the Chumash. So Isaiah chapter 45, verse 6 and 7, where God is the speaker. And, he, he, and, and Isaiah is, is speaking the words of God, although Isaiah is choosing the wording according, again, to, uh, the, to the Jewish uh, tradition, where he says, I make peace and me shalom ra and I uh, create evil, right? God says, I make peace, but I create evil. So he creates everything, even evil. But then notice how he says it. I make peace, I'm the doer of peace, and I create evil, right? So even though God is the creator of evil, and ultimately he is the doer of every action, the way that it's worded in scripture is a way that we should think about it. Um, and then he says, Anni Adonai kol eleh, that I am the Lord and I do all of these things. I do all of these things. So, so God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for Maimonides, God, Habvore, the creator, is the only creator. He's the only creator. And he's a doer of all actions. So God's omnipotence includes the power to will that which is evil from our perspective, right? So this is an important concept. God's omnipotence, his qudra, includes the power to will that which is evil, at least from our perspective. So the rationalists, they denied this, and they said things like good and evil have intrinsic uh, properties, and that, that the intellect knows, and that God is bound to act within. Right? So good and evil exist outside of God as absolute uh, uh, things. Um, they have intrinsic properties. And so God is bound to be good according to what is good. So this whole idea is, is, a, is a philosophical argument that is brought out by Plato. Uh, the, the euthyphro dilemma. Right? Are things good because God uh, says they're good? Um, or does God say they're good, so therefore they're good, uh, this argument. Ultimately, ultimately, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the standard of good, right? Good and evil do not exist as, they don't have any type of sort of ontological existence up there in the ether somewhere, distinct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who determines what is good and what is evil. So this is what he's getting at here. Um, just to give some more notes here um, from the Orthodox tradition of Judaism, the rabbis say that that faith, iman, which they call emuna, it requires yadi'a, or ilm, knowledge, or ma'rifa. Um, in other words, uh, credulity, believing in something without evidence, is actually blameworthy, right? So you must know, 
that God exists. You must know that within yourself, right? You have to prove it to yourself that God exists. You have to find evidence of God's existence. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ As the Quran says, know that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So the aql, uh, the aql comes first. The aql in, in Hebrew is called the sechel. And it is a necessary condition of, of naql, and we would concur with this, right? In order for you to be tasked to believe in the revelation of God, the naql, you have to have intellect. It's a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient condition because there are other conditions, right? But it certainly is necessary. So it's necessary for you to be able to understand at least like, what is the difference if, if we say, for example, God has neither kathra or adad, right? God has no, multi no multiplicity whatsoever with respect to kathra or adad, right? To, to understand what that means, you know, like this is one pen, right? But this pen is composed of multiple things. That's called kathra. So this has nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you might have two pens, right? So uh, a plural of numbers, this has nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You might have three similar pens. You might have three pens that in essence they're, they have penness, right? But one's blue, one is red, and one is black. So different attributes of one essence. That has nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's important. We'll get back to that idea as well when we talk about the rigid uh, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So <clears throat> the rabbis say that emuna begins with a sechel en. So faith begins where the intellect stops, right? But the sechel leads you to faith. The akal, the intellect, leads you to faith. They are not in conflict, right? The sechel is not a hindrance to God. It can be trusted to a certain degree. We, we use logic. At some point, logic will break down, especially when we talk about God, we talk about metaphysics, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is greater than human logic, but we still use logic. So it's really a faith based on evidence, right? It's reasonable faith, right? Like Richard Dawkins is incorrect when he says that faith is belief without evidence. That's not what it is at all, right? You believe because it is reasonable to believe. It's reasonable to believe in God. Again, that's the task of the dialectical theologian. That's the task of Maimonides in the uh, Dalalatul Ha'irin, the guide for the perplexed. Why is it reasonable to believe in God? Right? How is belief consistent with reason? This goes all the way back to the pre-Socratics. The pre Someone like Heraclites, who just looked at nature. And in the Quran, we are uh, encouraged to look at nature, look at what Heraclitus called logos. We talked about this last week as well. There's, there's, there's an ordering principle in nature. Things are ordered. Things are predictable in nature. Right? He called that logos or, or logos. The Quran says, Afala yanduruna ilan ibili kefa khuliqat. Do they not look at the camels and how they're created? Right? Look at the creation of the camel. It's incredible. Right? Um, Look at the heavens, how he raised them high, how he made the, the earth to appear like a carpet. These are great signs. Look at nature. It's evidence of God. The alam, right? That's what the world is called. The alam is, 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 is related to alama. It's a great sign of Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. Uh, so that's, um, that's important. So Heraclitus, he looked around and he saw logos. Now, later on, a, another philosopher that's still pre-Socratic, uh, Anaxagoras, I believe, he said, look, if there's logos in nature, if there's order in nature, then someone must have ordered it, right? There must be some grand intellect, and he called it the noose, the intellect. The noose is the one who ordered the universe. So that's what his intellect, that's what his reason uh, uh, compelled him to admit that there's order in the universe, and someone must have put it there. There must be some uh, intelligence that has ordered the universe. All right? So the rabbis, they speak of Ibrahim, 
And they call him Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham. That he looked at creation and he came to know that God exists. Right? So Abraham, according to the Jewish tradition, was a type of evidentialist. Right? That you look at evidence to arrive at faith in God. And there's something of this in the Quran as well. We find in Surah Al-An'am, Ibrahim alayhi salam, looking at a star, a najm, have a rabbi, this is my Lord, falamma afala, and then it's set. This is not my Lord. Right? And then he saw the moon, this is my Lord, have a rabbi, and then it's set. Allah, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides me, I shall be of those who are lost. Then he saw the shams, the sun. Right? Hadihi rabb, this is my Lord. Falamma afalat, and then it's set. Right? So don't get the wrong idea here. There's no question of Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, even entertaining the thought of worshipping these celestial bodies. Right? This is his argument against his people. He's trying to demonstrate to them the futility in the worship of things that are mutable, things that change. If something is changing, it's constantly changing, even if it's predictable, if it's changing, then it's not eternal. If it's not eternal, then it cannot be worshipped in its right. It's not a ma'bud bihaqihi. Right? Uh, so this is, uh, wallahu alam, this is the point. This is what we get from the argumentation. This is, this is and Imam At-Tabari says there's a bit of sarcasm here, that this is the argument he's presenting to his people, that you're worshipping these celestial bodies, right? He's trying to understand their thought process, explain it to them, and, and, and try to drive home the futility of, of, of worship of, of creation. Right? God cannot change because God is perfect, and you can't improve on on perfection, right? So the, anth the anthropic principle, right? The teleological argument. Um, some people call this the, argu the argument uh, for intelligent design or fine-tuning, the great watchmaker analogy, going back to William Paley. So the midrash, which is the word for tafsir in Hebrew, the midrash um, says that Ibrahim alayhi salam, as a child, uh, he figured this out by listening to his neshama. This is a term in Hebrew, neshama, which is translated as mind. Um, it's more like fitra, right? I would say kind of a theological or moral uh, compass, uh, the level of the soul that sort of uh, pulls you towards a greater understanding of the divine. And this is the purpose of uh, the Shabbat, Yom Shabbat, Yom Sabt. <clears throat> according to uh, Judaism, is that when the body is not working, you can listen to your neshama, you can listen to your moral compass, uh, if you will. And you reflect upon God and his greatness, you listen to your soul without any type of worldly uh, distractions. So this is a bit akin to the Maturidi position of aqal ma'aqal, that the aqal uh, is... Um, there, there's enough evidence for the aql to arrive at a creator god, right? But the intellect must be aided with naql to know the sharia, the sacred law. Although the uh, one could argue that there are ma'roof, right? There are things that are simply known uh, through the intellect, through thing, through innate knowledge that's still given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's given by the uh, al-wahhab, the one who bestows from and that's a, a, long, a long argument about whether we have innate knowledge or uh, whether we don't. Okay, so that's basically the first, um, uh, the first point here, the first principle. Just to recap it again, God alone is a creator. There's only one creator. He is the direct doer of all things, the primary cause, the efficient cause. That's principle number one. Principle number two for Maimonides, he says, the same beginning, he says, I believe with sound faith that the Creator, blessed be his name. He says, Hu Yahdi, Huwa Wahid. Remember Imam at Tahawi's first statement, In Allah Wahidun La Sharika La. Right? So here Maimonides says, God is Yahid, which is Wahid, that's the cognate. He is one, he is uniquely one. And, he, and then he continues, And there is not 
a uniqueness or oneness like him in any way, shape, or form. Right? In any way, shape, or form. So a lot of emphasis. He continues to say, and he by himself is our God who was, is, and will be. Or that, that he was our God oh, and is our God and always will be our God. Again, very poetic here, using the perfect tense and then immediately the active participle, then the imperfect tense. So basically here then, in this, with this principle, God is unique and he's radically one and immutable. Right? He doesn't change. Right? Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I am the Lord and I change not. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as salam. Right? And this is one of the words, this is one of the names of God according to the rabbinical tradition as well. It doesn't mean the peace, it means the perfect. That God is perfect. He doesn't change because he is perfect. And you cannot improve on perfection. So the commentators also go to say here that God does not incarnate um, into human flesh. He doesn't become a human being. This would compromise his radical uniqueness and his immutability. He is also transcendent of space, time, uh, and matter. Right? So the word for uniqueness or oneness in Arabic, wahdaniya. The Hebrew equivalent is yachiduth, yachiduth, wahdaniya. Right? In the great statement in the Torah, the great a uh, monotheistic statement of the Torah is Deuteronomy 6.4. So remember Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Chumash, the fifth book of the five books of Moses. It's called Deuteronomy. That's the, na that's the English name taken from uh, the Latin um, or Greek, meaning second law. 6.4 of Deuteronomy, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. This is like their Shahada, right? So when one enters into Judaism, and one can convert into Judaism, um, there's, there's, um, an, a, there's some sort of misunderstanding, popular misunderstanding, that Judaism does not allow uh, proselytes or converts. That's not true at all. You can convert to Judaism. And when one does convert to Judaism, one will recite the Shema. The Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? And... Um, Devout Jews, they try to recite this as much as they can. They want it to be the last words on their tongue before they die. That God is Echad. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The, word, the Hebrew word Echad is spelled exactly the same as Ahad. Qul huallahu Ahad. God is one. Right? And there's some interesting, curious parallels uh, to uh, Plato. In the Parmenides, for example, Plato refers to God uh, as Tahen, the One, right? Of course, Plotinus, who wrote Aeneides, who's the great formulator of Neoplatonism, which is a third century religious interpretation of Plato, we have this um, uh, whole system. He's a system builder, the hierarchy of being, and so on and so forth, and the, the Godhead consisting of the, the one that he said, tahen, then you have the logos, then you have the psuche, the spirit, right? And we'll talk more about that when we get to Christianity because Christians borrowed from this idea. Uh, but even if we go back to Plato again, in the Timaeus, right, one of his uh, dialogues, he says that God looked around the world and he said it was good, right? Uh, and that is very curious parallel to something we find in Genesis 1 when God is creating in stages right, on these different, uh, um, what is the plural of yom in, in Hebrew? I think it's yomim. I think it's a sound plural. We'd say ayam in Arabic. God is, when God is creating different things on these yomim, after each day he says, ki tov, it is good, it is good. And this is something that, Plato says in the Timaeus, uh, there is this legend, right? This is sort of ad hoc. There's no strong evidence of this, but there's this legend, very interesting, that Plato was captured at Syracuse, and he was enslaved, and he was brought to Egypt. 
And Egypt at the time of Plato had a pretty sizable Jewish population. I mean, Alexandria in Egypt uh, would be one of the great Jewish capitals of the world. The, the first place where the Torah was translated into Greek, into any other language, the first language was Greek, was in uh, Alexandria, Egypt in 250 before the Common Era. So there's a, there's a sizable population of Jews living in Egypt. And the legend is that Plato in Egypt read the books of Moses. And he was highly influenced uh, in his metaphysics. Right? Again, there's no evidence of this. It's conjecture, but it's an interesting theory. Of course, Plato is much more metaphysical than someone like Aristotle, even though Aristotle studied under Plato. If you've ever seen that great painting of Raphael, right? it's called the Academy, where you have uh, all these philosophers. And then right in the middle, on the left side, I believe, you have Plato, who's holding the Timaeus, right? his most metaphysical work. And he's pointing up like this. Because for Plato, um, reality, I mean, the real essences of things are found in the celestial realm. What we have here are just uh, shadows on the wall, if you will. Right? So here, um, the famous uh, theory of ideal forms in the celestial realm, the essences of things. Right? Um, and of course, the, the essence or the form of the good, to Agathon, is God. He's the form of the good for Plato. This idea would be bothered, would be borrowed by Middle Platonists who are religious, and they would say all of these forms, God's mind, right? Um, but Aristotle in that, in that painting is to the right, and he's holding his ethics, and he's got his hand over the earth like this. He's not pointing up, he's pointing parallel to the, to the earth because Aristotle is an empiricist. Uh, and a hylomorphist. And he believed that the essences or forms of things are in matter itself. Form or essence and matter are not separate, as, as Plato taught. So that was a major difference of opinion that Aristotle had with his teacher Plato. But nonetheless, whatever happened here, it's an interesting, curious parallel between Genesis and some of the Platonic uh, dialogues. <clears throat> So Shema, right? So the Shema, right? Their Shahada begins with hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And to hear doesn't just mean to hear, it means to receive, to accept. Really, it means to obey, right? So the five senses, the five physical senses, um, they correlate to different spiritual senses, if you will. Right? There's sort of a correlation dealing with spirituality. So in scripture, to give you an example, um, uh, hearing something means to obey. Right? They said, we believe, uh, we, we hear, and we obey. So this is, these are synonymous. This is a synonymic juxtaposition here. Right? They're synonyms. To hear something means to obey. To see something means to understand. It's an interesting ayah in the Quran. In tad'uhum ila al-huda la yasma'u. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to the Prophet sallallahu When you call them to guidance, right, they don't hear. What does it mean they don't hear? They didn't hear the words of the Prophet sallallahu Of course they heard him. They don't obey him. Wa tarahum yandhuruna ilayka wa la yubsirun. And you see them looking at you, but they didn't see. You see them looking at you, but they don't see. Right? To see something means to understand something. Right? You say that in English. Someone explains something to you, you say, ah, I see. Right? And then you have three different degrees of experience. Smell, touch, and taste. Smell something, right? You don't quite touch it, but you get something of it. Then you touch something. That's a deeper level of experience. And then you taste it. <clears throat> That's the deepest. right? You take it into your body. You accept it completely. It's dhok, right? Imam Ghazali talks about this. Dhok, to taste one's faith. There's hadith that mention the sweetness of faith, the taste, 
right? The sweetness of faith. So the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, doesn't just mean hear, it means to obey. Right? Obey, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? So the rabbis say that Hashem Echad, God is one. Yes, it's not enough to just accept the rational proposition that God is one, just to give it some ear service. One must prove one's faith, they say by following the commandments, the mitzvot. This is the Hebrew term that's used uh, in the Bible. Mitzvot are commandments, all right? So there are three requirements for the new convert, right? And I think the, the misunderstanding comes from <clears throat> the idea that in Orthodox Judaism, as well as conservative Judaism, it is not necessary for one to convert to Judaism in order to be successful in both worlds. This is very interesting, right? So Jews in the Orthodox tradition and the conservative tradition and other reform as well, although when we get to reform Judaism, many of them don't even believe in God. So we'll, we'll just talk about the Orthodox tradition. Um, there are seven laws that they call the Noahidic laws. The Noahidic laws, the Noahide laws, they're called the um, the Sheva uh, Mitzvotai Vani Noach, the seven laws of the children of Noah, that for non-Jews. So if you're born outside of the Jewish faith, or your mother is not Jewish, if your mother is Jewish, then you have to follow all 613 of the commandments. There's no way out of it. You can't say, I converted to Islam, Therefore, I'm just going to follow the seven Noahidic laws, and I'll be fine. That conversion is not acceptable. If your mother is Jewish, you are Jewish. So in Judaism, uh, uh, the Jewish faith is passed matrilineally. The tribe comes from the father, you know, whatever your tribe, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Levi, right? The, the, the tribe of, of Simeon, of Issachar, whoever, you're, whoever it might be, the 12 tribes. But Jewishness is passed through the mother, right? But let's just say that you're, um, you're an Iranian like me, right? Uh, my mother is not Jewish. So if I believed, if and I kept the seven Noahidic laws, and these seven Noahidic laws, uh, Jews would argue, are ma'ruf, they're known, they're innate, they're axiomatic, right? Everybody knows them. Um, they are, uh, God is one, or sometimes they explain it by saying that there's, the, uh, people know innately the futility of worshiping idols, the futility of worshiping material things. They know innately that's wrong, even though a lot of people do that. It goes against the fitra, and of course the fitra can be corrupted. Right? God is one, not to steal, not to commit adultery, right? Um, no, um, uh, not to murder. Right? Um, not to. Animal while it's still alive. Basically, what that means is respect creation, respect animals, respect all of creation. Uh, set up courts of justice is one of them as well. Um, see if I can. I think I'm missing one here. Yeah. Oh, don't blaspheme God. Right? So you know, recognize there's a single creator, God. That's the first one. And then not to blaspheme God or curse God. So if one recognizes that God is a creator and he's all powerful and he's, and he's the creator of us, he's the creator of everything, then one knows not to dis be disrespectful towards God. So those are the seven. So according to Judaism, if one, if a Gentile, that's the word for non-Jew or goy in Hebrew, if a goy follows these seven Noahidic laws, they will be successful in this life and the next. And the next life is what takes precedence. They call it the olam haba, the world to come. This is the olam hazeh. This is this world, right? And then there's an olam haba, the coming world, right? So one follows these seven Noahidic laws. So rabbis are trained. If someone comes to them, if a goy comes to them and says, I want to convert to Judaism, 
The rabbis are trained to turn that person away three times. Because for them, there's no need to convert to Judaism. If you follow the seven Noahidic laws, you'll be successful. Right? But, they say, if you become a Jew, then the burden of spreading the light of El Echad falls down on your shoulders. Now you have a, a great responsibility to spread the light of monotheism to all the nations. And you're going to fall short of that. And oftentimes in Jewish history, you have what's known as collective punishment. You have the Jewish nation being punished as a whole. So the rabbis would tell the proselyte, if you want to convert, get ready for a lot of trials and tribulations and musibat and so on and so forth. It's not going to be easy. Or you can remain a non-Jew, follow the seven Noahidic laws, and you'll go to the next life and you'll be in a good state. So what's then the incentive for becoming a Jew then? Why would anyone convert to Judaism? Well, if you convert to Judaism and you keep all 613 commandments, right, and you do them and you suffer in this world, you will have the highest of stations in the next life. That's the incentive. So there's degrees in the olam haba, in the world to come. I'm out of time. We'll continue talking about these principles next time, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.